Salutations all. This is Juiciest Slice, here to discuss what I consider a weird film. A twisted journey into the depravity, deviance, and despoilment of humankind played out against a backdrop of the debased world of fetish pornography and the production of a genuine snuff film, 8mm. I won't go into if real snuff films exist, i.e. films made expressly to show the murder of human beings for financial gain and the gratification of others. What's important is that the one in this story is real. So what do you get when you mix an impersonal quest to discover shadowy truths with a deep dive in way over one's head carried out for personal gains? In more recent years, you get an interesting glimpse into snuff broadcast online, The Den. But right at the tail end of the last millennium, you get the darkest midnight odyssey into the bizarre and grimy labyrinthine thoroughfares of fetish skin flicks, where the darkest truth of all can be discovered, 8mm. Directed by the multifaceted Joel Schumacher, that he helmed a dark film like this and the campy Batman and Robin is a little astonishing. From a script by the writer of Seven, the bar, who's in the bar? Andrew Kevin Walker, produced by Gavin Pallone and Judy Hoffland, the film stars Academy Award winner Nicolas Cage <laughs> as private investigator Tom Wells. In recent years, he often brings a whole party platter to his performances. I love my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! But in this one, there's nary a slice of cheese or ham in sight. Acting powerhouse Catherine Keener as Amy Wells, Tom's wife, a rather thankless but important role. In one of his earlier adult roles, another Academy Award winner, Joaquin Phoenix. Now, I don't know what you're looking for, but uh, so we're clear from the start, I'm straight. As Max California, an aspiring musician and smut store cashier who aids Tom, Tony Soprano himself, James Gandolfini. As sleazy talent scout, Eddie Poole, a guy who knows a thing or two about wood chippers. <laughs> Peter Stormar. As fetish porn director Dino Velvet, talented Chris Bauer, as BDSM performer George Anthony Higgins, aka Machine, a woman with a career that spanned decades, Myra Carter, as Mrs. Christian, Tom's employer, a man Hannibal Lecter considers an old friend, I'm having an old friend for dinner. Anthony Heald, but how many people seem to be realistically killed in movies and on television every day? As Daniel Longdale, Mrs. Christian's smarmy attorney, Jenny Powell, <laughs> as victim Marianne Matthews, an actress of stage and screen Amy Morton, <laughs> as Janet Matthews, Marianne's beleaguered and depressed mother. 8mm first came to my attention when previewed back in the day. I was a teen and the premise was instantly promising. This was long before talk of secret red rooms and the dark web, and I knew little about even the notion of snuff other than maybe something like Faces of Death. I wasn't even aware of the 1976 exploitation splatter film Snuff. As an ardent fan of creepy urban legends, the whole concept was tantalizing, and it was basically an instance of Shut up and take my money! I rented the film the second it hit video stores. I would say 8mm didn't disappoint, and acted as something of a springboard for researching the subject. Not to mention it stars the legendary Nick Cage before financial woes many took any role offered. When we meet Tom Wells, he's hard at work. It becomes clear that as part of his choice of career, he hobnobs with the powerful and elite. Yes, Mr. Wells, thank you. Certainly, Senator. Let me know if I can be of further assistance to you. I'll be in touch. A means of expanding his career. Then why'd you go? Senator Michelson has powerful friends. Soon after, the attorney Longdale, who represents wealthy widow Mrs. Christian, contacts him because of his sterling reputation for straddling the line of the law. The strict adherence to confidentiality. Thank you, ma'am. It seems in the wake of her billionaire husband's death, a rather delicate piece of rather egregious bondage film was found in his safe apparently showing the cruel murder of a young woman. Tom watches the footage. Disturbed by the apparent authenticity, but 
but is unsure if it's real or fake beyond all doubt. He suggests Mrs. Christian go to the police for verification, but that's a no-go for obvious reasons. Would be out of uh, that would be so completely unnecessary for any number of reasons, not the least of which is Mr. Christian's reputation. Mrs. Christian wants to know if it's fake and enlists Tom to get to the bottom of it. Opportunistic, seeing a chance to curry the favor of even more high-paying, prestigious clients, he takes the job, his first mistake. Optimistic, he will discredit the film's legitimacy. Tom's marriage is hurt by distance, but it's obvious he cherishes his wife and daughter, Cinderella. She missed you. Yeah, I missed you. In fact, he seems most motivated to improve his family station due to outside judgment. I didn't know we needed a break. Uh, your father seems to think we do. At the cost of time with his family. All right, Tom Wells. Devil's waiting on you. Not very sure of the case, he makes some headway. At least garnering info about the film stock itself to pinpoint a time period. Missing person files lead him to the identity of the victim. Her name was Marianne Matthews, and he's able to track down her mother, Janet, in North Carolina, and manipulate his way into her home by acting official. Mrs. Matthews? Hi, I'm Thomas Hart. I'm a state license investigator. Where he uses hollow diplomacy to dispel any greater hope his visit may inspire. All I'm saying is please know that, that I'm not here to create any false hope. And is able to find Marianne's hidden diary. in which there's a letter for her mom. Dear Mom, if you're reading this, it probably means I called you from Hollywood, California. Something in the letter rings particularly true. Don't come looking for me because I'm not coming back. This scene is effective because it gives voice to the victim when she has been dead and buried in a shallow, unmarked grave for over half a decade. She was a real, fully-fleshed person. Warren Anderson and me are in love, and I'm going to start a whole new life with him with dreams and aspirations. Warren will become a star in action movies, and he says I'm prettier than a lot of girls in movies, and I could be a star too. Cut short by cruel men out to make a fast buck. Maybe someday you'll see me on TV or in magazines. Don't worry about me. Love, Marianne. So Marianne ran off to Hollywood with her miscreant boyfriend. Only Tom finds the now ex-boyfriend, having failed in his ambitions of stardom, big surprise, locked up locally for a B&E. Turns out he dumped Marianne soon after getting out west, abandoning her and leaving her at loose ends. Before heading that way, Tom speaks to Mrs. Matthews again, and perhaps beginning to see a bleak outcome on the horizon, asks if she would rather remain ignorant and imagine the best, or know for sure what happened to Marianne even if it's bad news. Her response will have a bearing on how the story unfolds. I would choose to know. Tom travels to L.A. and scours the seedy underbelly. In his journeys, he visits a porno shop to procure some classified ad magazines and has his initial run-in with Max California, a reader of Truman Capote, who tries to play Cupid. Can I interest you in a battery-operated vagina? Tom turns him down. I'd hate to see you caught in one of those everyday situations that calls for a battery-operated vagina and you just don't have one, you know what I mean? I'll risk it. And goes about his business. About to give up, he discovers a clue in the footage. Mrs. Christian, there were three men. But an expensive image-restoring process only reveals the back of a head. Not being one to let sleeping dogs lie, at this point, Tom kicks it up and recruits Max to be an inroad to the underworld of illegal porn. Remember me? Oh, yeah. Came back for the better operative vagina after all. Max has a wise warning. It's not too late to change your mind about all this. I'm going to tell you, there's things that you're going to see that, that you can't unsee. They get in your head and they stay there. Or two. You dance with the devil. The devil don't change. The devil changes you. But for a price, agrees to help Tom find what they can. This does not always go well. Those days, huh? In fact, at every turn, he seems to meet resistance. There's no such thing as snuff. When they think they hit pay dirt. Uh, is it real? 
sickest shit you'll ever see. They determine it's fake. Wait a minute, wait a minute, that's the same girl. Tom tries another route and goes to local missions to ask if anybody recognizes Mary Ann, which brings him into possession of her suitcase. He finds some phone numbers scrawled on a piece of paper. leading to the company celebrity films and the sleazebag recruiter, Eddie Poole. A crass, crude man, he barely tolerates Tom's presence, and when pressed... Please, if you just take a look... ...he's dumb. Never seen it. He puts off a suspicious enough vibe Tom begins surveillance. This'll be fine. ...and in the dead of night breaks into his office to bug his phone and place a tracer. Tom uses a gambit to push Eddie. I know all about it. Yeah, you know all about what? And twists the knife. About that girl. Six years ago. So to speak. You murdered her. Who quickly makes a call that goes bad for him. We gotta talk. And we can't talk on the phone. So one of us has to get on a plane. Or something, alright? But Tom is able to trace it to Dino Velvet in New York, a niche porn maker who specializes in filming brutality. Meanwhile, Mrs. Christian gives Tom some odd financials from the period of time when the footage was produced. Now, totaled together, the five checks from the five different accounts, they equal one million dollars. Through Dino's violent fetish films, Tom finds the leather-masked brute from the footage. and Max recognizes his persona. He always wears a mask. He calls himself Machete. No, Machine. Yeah, everybody calls himself Machine. They do their best to meet Dino. Tell him we're here to give him a large sum of money. If he's not interested, we'll split. And succeed. From there, they put on a charade that they want to commission a one-of-a-kind film, with the stipulation that Machine be the performer and Tom be allowed to watch the filming. For the right money, of course, Dino will do business, and has some disturbing words for Tom. You know, you have a very special, very beautiful face. Dino's predatory and brutal work makes clear he's a sadist who fashions himself an artist to cloak his degeneracy. What he does is the cinematic equivalent of the abhorrent torture stage shows conducted by Master Sardou in the rather repulsive 1976 film Bloodsucking Freaks. Only unlike Sardou, for the most part, Dino falls short of breaking the law. But he's been behind the camera for at least one murder, so it's safe to assume he's not someone you want to sleep on, not someone you want to underestimate, especially since he has one beastly pawn in machine. Following the meeting, Tom sends Max back to California for his safety. Hey, look, let's not make a big deal out of this, okay? There's a plane ticket in there, and... A flight and catch back to L.A. tonight. This is as far as I want you to go on this thing. But is too remote to understand the true gravity of the situation and realize he too is tiptoeing on a razor's edge. He's operated as a rogue entity and orchestrated events to push toward the truth, unaware his failure to recognize his own vulnerability has set him up for a tremendous fall. Tom has gone about his investigation detachedly, likely to keep his personal feelings barricaded, and in so doing has pulled strings to press forward without too much consideration of those he's pursuing, neglecting to realize the powers of self-interest will align to bring him down. Filming is set to begin when it's revealed that the villains in this drama know Tom's identity and purpose. Mr. W, would you be so kind as to remove any firearms from your person? They strip him of his firearm and all sense of safety in about two seconds flat. The last one, this last one. Eddie arrives and identifies him from their brief interaction. Tom designed this whole development because he arrogantly failed to consider he could lose the upper hand, something that remained a possibility even without the next development. But any speculation in that regard is moot, as in reality he was hamstringed right from the onset, a sad fact we learn at the revelation the smarmy attorney Longdale, having been part of commissioning the snuff film on Mr. Christian's behalf, has known the truth all along. Criminal business acquaintance of ours to explain everything. Satan ex machina. They also expose they've abducted Max to extort Tom into immediate compliance. 
there is an incentive. Having coordinated this nightmare scenario, Tom thought he was in control right up until the trapdoor was sprung. And now he knows that he's in control of, well, you know, Ash said it best. Jack and shit. Jack left town. And it was that way even before he took the job. Longdale escorts him to retrieve the footage and lays bare painful truths. Higher up the social food chain, the scummy attorney used and made a fool of Tom, and reveals he's kept a close eye on him. Since just before I met you, there isn't much you've said or done that I, I haven't been party to. And lays the blame at his feet. None of this would be happening if you would have just given up and walked away. Tom might skirt the law, but suffice to say it has never led to such trouble as it did this time around. And it's a ruthless lesson that what's gotten him ahead is also responsible for his downfall. Praising. I never expected you to get this far. Braiding. I hired you because you're young, not terribly brave. Scolding. Completely out of your league. And commending. But I underestimated your ambition. Him in turns. Longdale makes mockery of the fact the desire to enrich himself was the lure that put Tom in his current predicament. You took one look at the Christian compound. It was heady, wasn't it? Huh? You weren't just peeking through the gates this time. Oh, Mrs. Christian, welcome you in. And asked somewhat rhetorically. Do you think that people like the Christians hire people like you, like me, as an invitation to their dinner parties? Only to make perfectly understandable the reality of their underling positions. <laughs> We're there to clean up the mess, to wipe their royal asses. Tom asks if it was worth his soul, to which Longdale is unapologetic. I've been well compensated, but you, I bought cheap. Then he points out Tom's culpability. Just because Mrs. Christian praised your discretion, you sat on evidence of murder, you dragged your friend into it, your family. And ridicules him for putting so much at risk for a dead girl no one remembers. Tom counters... Marianne Matthews, that was her name. Her mother remembers her. And Longdale isn't moved or having it. I'll, I'm bored with this. And points out the thing that separates them most. You know the only difference between you and me? I will survive this and profit by it. You? you will not. Tom can't wrap his mind around the purpose of Mr. Christian's desire for the film. Why did he want a film? A little girl be butchered! The lawyer doesn't disappoint in his callous response. Because he could. He did it because he could. What other reason were you looking for? What more reason would an exceedingly moneyed person need other than because they could? They return with the footage at which point Machine unceremoniously slices Max's throat. A candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Tom is forcibly handcuffed to a bed frame, and the reel of Marianne's murder is destroyed before his eyes. So it ends. Dino makes another hard truth plain. As if she never existed and even has some kind of sympathy for Tom's plight. Come on, don't blame yourself. You ran away over your head. Tom makes known that Longdale was paid a million dollars in cash and wants to know why they're all still small time with that kind of money to spread around, turning Dino, Eddie, and Machine against Longdale. He tries to save his own skin, but Dino has other ideas. Okay. Action! And they wind up killing each other. Dino is sorely disappointed. I'm supposed to have something more cinematic. Machine attacks Tom, who is able to stick him good. <laughs> Eddie goes for a gun, but Tom is able to get one bullet in his clip. <laughs> Pesky Machine notices the detail. So Eddie, sleazebag that he is, tries to skedaddle, and Tom has to choose freedom overtaking control of either man. He flees, and Eddie is able to reach a gun, but Tom manages to escape with his life.
Tom alerts his wife and orders her to go to a place only they know, and then contacts Mrs. Christian and explains everything, saying he will meet with her to go to police because she is his only corroborative witness. He then goes to his wife and apologizes for ghosting her during the investigation. So that's it. Tom found the identity of the victim and her killers. Time to hand over his findings to law enforcement so justice can be served. But that's where this film gets even weirder. Upon learning of the truth, Tom finds out that... Miss Christian chose to take her own life this afternoon, Mr. Wells. Erasing the last proof of the crime and showing the elite can be every bit as morally spineless as a lowly commoner. Envelopes full of cash have been left for him and Janet Matthews like that will somehow fix everything. This unanticipated wrinkle leaves him tail spinning. Well aware Eddie and Machine are still out there and know his identity. He tells his wife, No one left to finish this but me. Returns to Hollywood and recklessly captures Eddie. Put your hands on your head, get down on your knees. Tom pulls no punches. I will never get tired of hurting you, Eddie. And makes it clear what will happen. You're going to show me where you killed her. Eddie opens up. Yeah, I talked to her. I told her everything she wanted to hear. I told her she was going to be a big star. And reveals quite a bit. She was going to make a lot of money. And all the rest of the bullshit. By the time I was finished with her, she was all excited about a big screen tag. Giving Tom a lot of details about Mary Ann's escalating terror. Brought her in and she... Saw a machine standing in the corner. Started crying. And vicious murder. Started cutting her up. That's it. Eddie maintains there's no evidence and he should cut him loose. Tom tells him he's going to kill him, but Eddie doesn't buy it. You're not going to kill me. You don't have it in you. And in some ways, Eddie's right. Tom has a moral quandary. He's ultimately a decent person. Killing is outside his ballywick. Even ending the malignant life of a raunchy oaf like Eddie, directly responsible for selecting the victim in Mr. Christian's snuff film, is a decision his logical mind can't quite reconcile. Tom is in the horrible position of being thirsty for revenge, while his underlying rationality makes him recognize he has no personal justification that would free him to act. What makes it so he feels it in his blood and guts is Cinderella, his baby girl. As a father, he can too easily empathize, but requires further motivation to overcome his moral dilemma and disavow his eternal code of ethics. So he calls Janet, the forlorn mama bear hunkered away in her cave in North Carolina, and tells her the horrific truth of her daughter's fate. Some men, they took her, and they killed her, and they buried her. No, 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 Sorry. No, no. And begs her for permission. Oh, I want to punish them for what they did. <laughs> what are you saying? That's... I can hurt them. Give me your permission to hurt them. Leads. Please. <laughs> and begs some more. Tell me how much she meant to you. Just tell me that you loved her. Please tell me that you loved her. Janet grants deliverance. I love her. I love her so much. Tom finds the ferocity within himself to be the hand of justice, vengeance, maybe both. He furiously beats Eddie to death with the butt of his gun and burns his worthless carcass. Back in New York, Tom calls around to hospitals pretending to be a police officer asking about men admitted for an abdominal wound, which gives him Machine's identity and address. The brutal killer lives a quiet suburban life with his mother, a devout Christian. With a silencer equipped pistol, Tom breaks in and after some cat and mouse play, they go head to head. Machine has insights. You're the best part of killing someone. Look on their face. He forces Tom to hear. But when they feel the knife go in, that's it. It's a surprise. Maybe as mockery for his heartfelt interest. I just can't believe it's really happening to him. She had that look. The girl. Tom gains control and demands he remove the mask. The reveal is almost anticlimactic because Machine is this guy. He sees the irony himself. What do you expect, the monster? Uh... 
and caught out is almost personable. M my name's George. Probably knew that already. Maybe enjoying the chance to talk. Can't get your mind around it, huh? I don't have any answers to give. He's surprisingly self-actualized, too. Nothing I can say to make you sleep easier at night. Well aware of his own overall lack of justification for the horrors he inflicts. I wasn't beaten. I wasn't molested. Mommy didn't abuse me. And reveals... There's no mystery. Things I do, I do them because I like them. Because I want to. His may be the most honest serial killer confession as to motive. Do they do it because they were neglected, abused, and pushed around? Those can certainly be factors, but when boiled down, most serial killers defile and take life because it's what gives them pleasure. Tom outmaneuvers the monster. <coughs> and maybe doesn't so much emerge victorious as just lucky to have survived. This film offers Pyrrhic victories at best. For giving his pound of flesh and bartering away a slice of his soul, Tom gets some vindication. Dear Mr. Wells, thank you for writing me and telling me your real name, who you really are, and what really happened. I'm glad those men are dead. No matter how small. I hated you for telling me the truth, but now I realize you and I are probably the only people that ever really cared about Mary Ann. Illegal. Wrong on many levels, he can go forward with the knowledge his actions avenged Mary Ann and offer Janet some small solace, even though enormous regret and guilt will always be his companions going forward. I would guess he had some nightmares concerning Max for a long time to come. So, what's this slickly made yet somehow darkly gritty film getting at in its twisted, windy, and inescapable way? Critic Janet Moslin wrote, 8mm delves into the perverse underworld of the pornography business, shocking audiences with the realization that sex and violence can be so dull. I feel like this reveals her total misreading of the film's point, and shows she was blind to what the film was really about. A young runaway who ran afoul of evil men, and wound up murdered for her trouble, and how that murder affects the man sent to discover the truth. She also seems unaware the porno business may seem inherently sexy, but really isn't, and any sense it's sexy is part of the fantasy sold by the industry, as it's far more work a day than one might assume. In my opinion, this is one of those films a lot of critics missed the boat on, because they couldn't see the forest or the trees. Many didn't look beyond the surface sleaze, sordidness, and salaciousness, the three S's exemplifying the exploitation standard, to the real story of human frailty, avarice, entitlement, abuse, and fear. Is this critical disregard due to the film asking the audience to reconcile that circumstances exist in which bloody revenge is the only solution that offers justice? Even if it's totally wrong by all societal standards? Wrong even for the man tasked with carrying it out? And that's just part of the darker underpinnings of humankind? That the film concedes that sometimes the only answer is vigilantism, even if it comes at a soul-strafing cost? These lessons are maybe more forebodingly truthful and harsh than mainstream critical analysis warrants worthy of what's ultimately meant to be an entertainment. Tom was certainly forced to learn harsh lessons, and will likely be haunted for all of his days after plunging to the deepest depths, his burden to bear for his choices. In this way, 8mm also acts as a warning against all the bad choices that led to the necessity for vengeful killing. In Mary Ann's case, she should have followed her dreams responsibly, and not been swayed to leap without a plan by a bad boy. Janet should have prioritized her daughter over a floundering romantic relationship if she wanted to maintain a strong bond with her kid. Tom shouldn't have pursued dangerous work to better his reputation over his family's safety. In Dino, Eddie, Machine, and Longdale's cases, they had to be decent human beings and not victimizers. I hold the most judgment for Mr. Christian, a man who achieved the kind of success and wealth most can only dream of, and used his stature to perpetrate wickedness. The film rubs the consequences of extreme irrevocable but completely avoidable violence in the audience's face and asks us to consider from whence this inequity sprang. Blame can be assigned all around, but who's the most at fault? 
since what the film exhibits is the ultimate escalation of perversion in society played out all the way down from the highest level, instigated by a member of the Blue Blood elite, Mr. Christian, I would say him. There was a huge fear in the 90s that because Spectacle had entered porn with huge selling videos such as The World's Biggest Gangbang, the eventual outcome would be the ultimate extreme, snuff. A prediction that was ultimately proven untrue as the proliferation of online porn catering to individual fetishes killed the video sales market and ended mass distribution. In 8mm, porn is merely a pretense, an underbelly to impale like a mortician strokar, since the snuff film wasn't made until a rich man paid for its creation. Because when he sent his toady Longdale to acquire a so-called snuff film, he met the same resistance Tom did. Because snuff was merely an urban legend, it didn't exist. If an affluent mover and shaker like Mr. Christian, likely having enjoyed an Ivy League education in every bed of it, a real creme de la creme, cream of the crop sort, can commission an exclusive snuff film purely to fulfill a whim, as an exclusive collectible, another expensive bauble to flaunt his wealth and potency, what does such moral degradation at the zenith of the social order say about society overall? Well, better yet, not even taking the job in the first place. As for Tom, he was punished for letting his ambition get the better of him, putting his family at grave risk. What if I could do with faces like these on film? Costing Max his life. Before you know it, you're in it, deep in it. He learned the folly of jettisoning good sense. Had he been willing to blow a little of his private dick cred to do the right thing, the footage would have been handed over to the proper authorities at a much earlier juncture, and those involved legally prosecuted. But Tom played it close to his chest, meaning he bears much blame in what went down, and by his own doing made it so he was the only one in a position to carry out justice. I don't think it's a coincidence that Tom's baby girl has a fairy tale name. Don't most parents want their children to have happily ever after lives? But as anyone who's read grim fairy tales can attest, not all fairy tales end happily. Many have dragons, monsters, and other assorted beasties. In this way, Tom emerges as a medieval knight out to slay dragons, not to claim riches, his initial motivator, but so that he can return to his keep with a clearer conscience knowing the dragons will wreak no more havoc. The thing of it is, though, at first, for treasure and glory, he went to the dragon's lair and forced the confrontation, bringing it to his borders. Had he done the right thing, he might have been positioned to come out as a hero. Instead, his moral ambiguity ensured he proved only a little better than the bad he sought to root out. I don't even want to speculate about the connotations of giving the evil old rich guy the last name Christian. Maybe commentary on how conservatism has been hijacked by wealthy people motivated by self-interest who use religion as a lever to divide society for sake of their own ends and aggrandizement? In final analysis, 8mm is maybe most about how the elite can exploit the less fortunate, how they can even entice them with the lure of money to bargain away their souls, but also how the money itself has done the same thing to some elite. The whole film might be a swipe against the corrupted elites who use their position to manifest bad over good, but it might also be commentary on how wealth can be corrupting in and of itself. That in allowing for far greater autonomy and ability to make things happen, the wealthy are encouraged to carry out their worst temptations. With no paid subordinates to fulfill the actions, would Mr. Krishna have gone through all the serial killer headache of procuring and killing a victim while filming the act? Seems unlikely. Then in some way he flirted with being a monster simply because he could afford to pay others to do the dirty work. In the end, he was only a killer by proxy, wanting another exclusive perk of his stature without having to literally get blood on his hands. Mr. Christian definitely seems like the type to have been a member of the secret society and martyrs, willing to invest in torturing innocent victims for sake of enlightenment. But that's really neither here nor there. What's important is that he sought snuff and in so doing ended seven lives, including that of his widow, and shattered three other lives besides. What a high cost for something so depraved. Without being encumbered with the options afforded by wealth, he could have done none of this, maybe proving true the old axiom money is the root of all evil. But maybe that's reaching since evil really doesn't require a budget to exist. 
This film might also be saying something about the power and draw of status, what one will do when they have it, and what others will do to try and gain it. Mr. Christian had the most standing and existed at the top, where he used his lofty position to commit evil. Tom ignored the law, maybe even what's right, because if he fulfills Mrs. Christian's desire, he will be pushed a couple of more places up the invisible status line. Mary Ann believed she could be a star and lift herself out of her humdrum run-of-the-mill existence. What was gained? If there's any judgment in the afterlife, the rich man tossed his soul in a trash can, for sure condemning himself to hell if Christianity is the one true religion. Tom's actions don't rise to that height of irredeemable, but the events were nonetheless scarring on every level. He was beyond doubt irrevocably changed, and whatever lesson he learned came at way too high of a cost. Mary Ann died horribly, knowing in her terrifying final moments there in that dark, dirty space, some dreams lead to nightmares. Poor kid, she also knew that a large, scary man decked out in black leather was going to have his way with her before snuffing her out. So nothing, nothing was gained. Is this an important film? I don't know about that. Is a Serbian film important? But the lore of snuff transitioning to the online realm, creating all kinds of new, possibly real urban legends such as murder vacation websites and red rooms where all matter of debauchery supposedly goes on, it remains in some way relevant. Is it worth a watch? For those into darker fare, I would say yes. It's a wild ride with a far more restrained Nicolas Cage we don't too often get these days, and a young Joaquin Phoenix before his star rose. I personally like it quite a bit and consider it a good companion piece to the equally scarring Seven. Well, I think I've reached the end of the rope, so I won't leave you dangling. If you've made it this far, thanks for listening to my ramblings. Please share any refutations, opinions, accusations, japes, or other ideas in the comments below. And please join me next time when I discuss another weird one. A film viewed in its day as so outrageous, controversial, indefensible, and plain terrible, it torpedoed the career of its director Michael Powell so badly it was unsalvageable. What some consider the earliest progenitor of the slasher subgenre, Peeping Tom. And just remember... Hey! Hey! It's like a gas station. You pay before you pump. Bye now.